Councilmember Gilliard here. Councilmember Willis here. Councilmember Gunn present. Councilmember Rao, you have a quorum. Let the record reflect that Ms. Gilliard is here. Okay. All right, Madam Clerk. First item on the agenda is a presentation by Ms. Kate Sevilla with AARP. Forgive me, I'm just calming down from driving from Midtown to get here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's very entertaining. So, um, how many of you, show of hands, don't be shy, know who AARP is, and you have, you're a member of AARP. It's all right. I'm too young. 50, I'm just, I just want you to see how good 50 looks right now. What you have? I got a call with him for him. Okay. <laughs> this is what you have to look forward to. The 50 plus club is looking really good. And um, I'm going to talk to you about our livable communities initiative, um, AARP, uh, National has partnered with the uh, World Health Organization. And before I get into it, how many, how much time do we have? Is that the eight minutes? Nine, ten minutes? Okay. All right. We can do this. We can do this. So, AARP has partnered with the uh, World Health Organization. Uh, we launched this. Uh, Age-Friendly and Livable Communities Initiative about five years ago. And so far, we have four states. Georgia is working towards in becoming uh, an age-friendly and livable state. We have uh, close to 400 communities and counties, and one territory, and that is um, Virgin, uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. So AARP is in every state of the union including the three territories, the uh, District of Columbia, uh, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. And so today, I'm here to talk to you about how we would love the uh, city of uh, South Fulton to join this network. So far in Georgia, we have six age-friendly communities, livable communities. Last month, Athens Clark joined us. Uh, Atlanta and Atlanta and Augusta uh, came in at 2014, and uh, Macon Bib, by the way, Macon Bib, believe it or not, was the first age-friendly community in the nation. So, Macon Bib, our, our own, was the first in the country, which is huge. And then last year, Tucker and um, Blue Cross joined. I don't need to tell you that. We're aging as a nation. Um, 
Asia is far ahead of us, Japan and China, because of they're one of the most populous places in the country. But we're aging, and um, AARP is working with our community leaders, our elected leaders, um, to prepare for it. Believe it or not, every day, 10,000 people turn 65. 10,000 people. So what we're doing is we're working with our communities to prepare for it, because we need to prepare for it. As we're living longer, um, a lot of us are active in our communities or are entrepreneurs. Most people think of entrepreneurs as the, the uh, millennial group, but the secret is out. The highest demographics of entrepreneurs are the 50-something. So I'm gonna skip through this. So when we talk about age-friendly, we're not talking about old people. I just wanna make that clear. When we're talking about age-friendly in a livable community, we're really talking about inclusion and diversity. We want to make sure that people that are in our communities, for instance, for the sidewalks, that you know, a five-year-old, a 15-year-old, person in a wheelchair, person uh, with a cane, family with a dog, that people can walk through the streets and they're safe. And now we're having to share the streets with folks that are biking to work or for leisure, and also they're our newest friends, the, the scooters. Are you all prepared for the scooters? No. And, <laughs> Not at all. Come visit us in Midtown. You'll see what that's like sharing the road. Um, so when we talk about uh, livable communities, there are eight really main areas that we deem as livable. And this is global. So uh, transportation is huge. We need to have a transit system and multiple ways to get around um, and safe for everyone, um, including those that have physical disabilities. Housing is another one, social participation, respect and social inclusion, uh, civic participation and employment. Remember I told you about entrepreneurs at the 50 plus are the leading group of entrepreneurs now, not your millennials. Um, and if you think about it, the millennials are asking who? Their parents and grandparents to be their first investors. Communications and information, um, huge and community support and our health services and of course outdoor spaces and buildings. So I'm gonna quickly go through the slides and bear with me. If you have a question, you know, just ask. Um, talked about outdoor spaces. It's really important that we have and plan for outdoor spaces and I know that you're thinking of that. So as you're thinking of that, think of them being accessible to everyone so that, you know, they are benches along the way for anybody to sit and uh, enjoy their time in the park or um, in these pool parks now that, they're, that are being established or walking trails. Transit is huge. Um, I wish there was a minor stop here. I could have taken the minor from it down. I would have been here in like, I don't know, 10 minutes. That something to think about. Um, Social, uh, I think I was where, housing, uh, social participation. I know you do that well here in uh, South Fulton, making sure that our, not only just the 50 plus population, but everybody of all ages are interacting the uh, intergenerational activities, whether it's fun, educational, et cetera. There's a lot for people to do. Um, housing. Making sure that we're planning for housing. Um, not everybody has a 2.5, whatever that means, family. Um, so uh, people need to have options for different types of housing, like tiny homes um, or um, cottages. <coughs> that way, <coughs> excuse me, they can age in place. My voice. <coughs> Sorry. Respect and social inclusion. I think I talked about this briefly about, you know, having multicultural and intergenerational activities. That's, that's really important. Not only for our folks that are aging in place, but also for our children. Uh, it's important that they see us in the community interacting in various capacities. <clears throat> Civic participation, I'm glad to see that they are 50 plus uh, folks here at this meeting um, that are engaged 
and they're engaged, whether they're volunteering or they're doing their fifth stick act in uh, career, which is wonderful because we need that. <clears throat> Community support and health services, it's important that we have those uh, types of services so people don't have to travel too far to get them and there is um, multiple ways to get there, whether it's ride share or public transit or they're in a community where people can, um, you know, be there for each other. So every, every city that joins the uh, livable communities uh, network goes through a formalized process. It's not tedious or long. All you have to do is fill out a, a membership application and a letter from the mayor with uh, committing to the city being part of this affiliation, not only within the U.S., but also being part of the World Health. It's very easy. I'm happy to, to sit down with your designee to go through it. Um, and each city has a livability index number. Um, think of this as, oh, thank you. Think of this as when you think of the, um, I think it's Money Magazine or Forbes List, you know, they have a top 10 universities or cities. The livability index is for us um, how we measure. And we measure based on those eight areas of, liver, uh, of um, eight, eight, uh, eight levels of livability, the domains. Uh, how do you stack against the city that's comparable to you in terms of transportation? Uh, cities that are really high up in transportation are cities like New York where, you know, you don't need a car to live there, but in some cities you need to have a car or you need to have mass transit. Uh, the process to join our livability uh, village is in front of you. Um, I think you guys have copies of my slide, but it's not that complicated, and the best thing is that it's free. So um, my information is, in, is at the end of the slide, and I do have cards in the packets that I've given out. I'm really grateful for your time, and I don't want to take any more. So thank you so much for inviting me. Councilwoman Gillard, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll take the question before. Madam President, let us show So, in order to join, you said to join is free. It is free, yes. So, after we join, what um, what does the organization find? So, uh, which is such my next slide? Thank you, Lord. Uh, the Roads of Livability series. We have lots of um, resources to help our communities. And what I like to tell the community is that you all are already doing this. It's just that we're here to help you kind of think of it with this lens of a partner with you um, in all things livable. Um, so when we have workshops on caregiving or transit, um, we're bringing in that voice. We're not just bringing in the voice of people that are 50 plus. We're bringing in that um, all ages because I know that you have what you have to do, but we're there to sort of remind you to think of to think of everybody, from the babies to to our um, centennials. It's not a big deal to be a hundred anymore. So do you all do workshops? Do you we do workshops. We do workshops on um, financial resilience. Um, another word for that is financial literacy. We do workshops on caregiving. You know, it does, if you're sick, it doesn't matter how old you, uh, you are. But for those that are adults, it's very complicated because they have a financial life. So if you're a caregiver, uh, we do workshops on that. Uh, we do workshops on um, fraud. Um, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're alive or dead. Somebody can take your identity and run with it and, and destroy that. So and we do that with the help of our volunteers and partners. Okay, so because if we become a part of this network, do we want an AARP um, uh, event or we want an AARP uh, representative to 
uh, be present at any of our community events? Are you saying that that's something that we will get being a part of this network? Yes, we would work with you on that. And we, AARP is not only uh, um, a nonprofit and lobbying, uh, nonpartisan organization, but we're a membership organization. We're also a volunteer organization. So in order for us to do that, I, I know that we have AARP members in your community, and we would be working with them along with you to uh, address some of these things, whether it's housing or transit or caregiving. We would be working alongside them with you. Okay, one last thing. Um, what I would love to see with AARP, if you all could give us like a comprehensive listing of all discounts that uh, people who are members of A. No, because I'm asked, I'm saying this because a lot of people who have AARP they don't know right. um, what benefits are available uh, for traveling, for uh, insurance, uh, for a lot of things. So if you can give us a comp, if we can have some type of pamphlet or something, um, and even an electronic. Uh, Late, because everybody doesn't uh, electronic. Right, not everybody is right. But something that we access. when we have community meetings that we can give our seniors, um, that would be very helpful. So I in my in the packet that I I had the gentleman help distribute, there is our member um, benefits book in there, okay. and it, it's blue. Yeah, you open that. I don't have. Okay, I got it. it. Looks I like have this. It. I have it. Yeah, it looks like this. Okay. And it's broken up in just what you were asking in category: travel, shopping, finance, okay. home so and if technology. If you can get us, uh, once we become a part of your network, if you can get us. Oh, a, a you don't have to join the the um, network. I'm happy to get these to you um, anytime. Okay. Yeah. And um, for those Thank who you. are not. 50 plus. I just want to say that you don't need to wait till you're 50 to join AARP. If you're old enough to vote, you can be an AARP member. So we are in the business of demystifying aging. We don't want people to be afraid to be 50 or age because it's a blessing. So, um, you know, not so join us. It doesn't matter how old you are, as long as you can vote. Can you no, also tell people if they have a spouse that's 50 and you're not, they are you a gift the spouse. And then you, you're benefiting from your spouse's <laughs> discounts. You know, I mean, just figure out how you want to play the this, the, the how you want to benefit. That's we're happy. We're here to to be of service and would love for you to to work with you. Thank we're you. already partnering with you indirectly. We just want to formalize it. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Thank you. very much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk. Next item is on the agenda. The police department would like to give a presentation on Bearcat vehicles. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to uh, present tonight for your consideration uh, a Bearcat vehicle. Uh, essentially what happens right now is that the SWAT unit is going out on armed gun calls and we don't have the ability to have a um, armed vehicle to go into those situations. So we're asking you all to consider the purchase of the uh, Bearcat armed vehicle. Um, this vehicle is known uh, throughout the SWAT community as a standard vehicle uh, for SWAT utilization. We also want to make sure that we're putting the proper protocols and uh, policies in place as it relates to the utilization of this vehicle. This right here is a picture of the uh, Bearcat. We certainly will be uh, you know, purchasing that. We don't want to use it in such a way that we're coming across as an occupying force in the community, but we also want to make sure that we're giving our police officers the equipment uh, that they need to go into those sort of situations. Um, the Bearcat is a recognized uh, platform and it has capacity to put about 10 to 12 uh, fully armed uh, SWAT officers in that vehicle. It also has an open floor plan so that if we have somebody wounded, we'll be able to go into that situation and remove them out. As I said earlier, it's a standard vehicle that uh, that's used in SWAT operations, and at this point, we don't have one. Um, I took a look at some of the um, cases where we would use this Bearcat, and uh, right now we have about 66 narcotics locations that we've got complaints from throughout the city. I'm sure there's more than that, but right now, 
Um, I've gotten complaints from you all, from citizens alike, and so we've kind of added that to a list, and we've started an investigation into those. And these are all scenarios where we would use this bear cat. Um, we're right now tracking 196 games, not in the city of South Fulton, but throughout the Atlanta metropolitan area. We've been working with a lot of gamings, and we've been working with uh, U.S. Marshals in an effort to try to increase our intelligence as it relates to them. Um, I know most of you are aware that we just did a search warrant on a couple of businesses along Old National. And just to give you a sense of what we're kind of confronted with, uh, we were able to buy a couple of machine guns out of one of those businesses. And so, obviously, having this capacity we do for our officers will be a great thing for our officers. Um, and we've had six armed gunmen situations, and we executed uh, 53 search warrants uh, in 2018, public to the day. And looking at how we would purchase this particular vehicle, we got with finance, and we spoke with them about some salary savings that we've uh, had over the course of the year. Uh, we did a complete analysis of our salary savings and our liabilities and our known expenditures moving forward into um, FY20. And uh, the finance department have given us permission to actually use 400000 from the $2.3 million that we had in salary savings to purchase this vehicle. Um, and so right now, we feel that we're in a big space to try to purchase as much needed equipment. Okay. Um, so, so you have some great statistics of that you, where, where would you have sent this vehicle in the past two years? Well, anytime we get ready to execute a search warrant, uh, obviously we want to go and use those at most narcotics locations. Um, in some of the situations we've seized, uh, I think I showed you on pictures where we see seven, eight, nine uh, handguns out of some of the drug locations that we've gone into. So I, in most of those locations is where we would take uh, this Bearcat, especially because this vehicle has the ability to pull um, burglar bars off doors, uh, it has the ability to uh, protect our, our personnel as we're going into those, those situations. So we want to make sure that they have those sort of tools when they're going into uh, narcotic locations. I just have to say personally that I'm not interested in seeing a vehicle like that in my neighborhood. Okay. Um, I'm not ready for that yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me say this. Mm -hmm. I had the unfortunate experience <coughs> of going to my cousin's house. Mm -hmm. And three doors down from my cousin's house uh, was a hostage situation. Right. And I was stuck in that situation at the police at 3 o'clock in the morning. Maybe a little later. Mm -hmm. Because it was all forced towards everywhere. But the thing that struck me more than anything else is that SWAT was called. And so when SWAT was called, they were called in their cars. Their SWAT equipment was in the trunk. They opened the trunk, put the SWAT equipment on, and got together in my cousin's yard to line themselves up to go and attack this situation. We owe our police better than that. And when I was in Fulton County, we had a bear cat. And I can tell you this, Mr. McLean, we used to go to the homeowner association and drive it down the street. And people applauded it just to see it here. And the difference between this one and the one, we had our gun turret on top of it. And so uh, it's a great thing. It helps not only the community, but it helps to make sure that our guys go home safe when they're called out to do a deadly and hazardous job. So I appreciate the fact that you look into it, and I would hope that this, this body will go through. The Captain, can, you, can I share a story with you? Absolutely. Back in the late 80s, I was a young homicide sergeant, and I was called out to a scene where an officer involved shooting had taken place. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Gregory Lawler who had uh, pulled out a, an assault rifle and shot two police officers. When we arrived on scene, uh, Gregory Lawler was still um, staged up inside of his town, uh, townhouse up in Buckhead. When we got there, every time a police officer tried to get next to one of the police officers that was lying in the street, um, Gregory Lawler would fire off a ramp. Um, and so at that time, in the late 80s, we didn't have the capacity at APD to even go and pull that police officer out of the street. And so I understand the optics of it, uh, but we actually, in that case, had to call a Brinks truck to come 
there so that we can go and pull that police officer out of the street. And I, like I said, I understand the optics of the vehicle and the way that it looks. It looks like you would be coming across as an occupying force of the community, but at the end of the day, our policies will dictate how that, how that um, uh, equipment is going to be used. And uh, I assure you, we won't misuse that equipment. Um, in response, I'll just say, I'm not just concerned about what it looks like. Um, I'm also concerned about like how we spend our resources. So like on one of those slides, you said we had like 96 drug houses or, you know, why do we have, if we know that they're there, right? Like, why are the owners allowed to either rent out or, you know, hold that property? I, I would like to see us move more towards crime prevention rather than just crime response. Like, I wonder how many youth programs we could sponsor with that $300,000 to stop the gang activity. Like I, I, I just want us to move from a place where we're not just responding to crime, but we're actively working across all of our departments to prevent crime. And, and uh, there is a, there is a uh, famous study by uh, Mr. Gary S. Becker at the University of Chicago. It's been replicated over 200 times. And what it has shown is that the greatest predictor of crime is income inequality. And so I think that we need to be focused on economic development and procuring resources and developing the people who live in our city. And I just want us to get as efficient at that as we are at policing. I think we're doing a great job of policing, so this isn't anything I towards understand. you. I, I just want us to do a better job at creating opportunities for people. <laughs> Well, I think we should take a comprehensive approach to attacking crime. I think we should be proactive. I think we should be reactive. And I also think we should send our officers out to be equipped to do the job. Um, one of the ways to minimize bear cats is to, is to get the drug uh, dealers out of our city. Then we won't have to worry about bear cats coming through our neighborhood. It is what it is. We didn't ask for the crime. It's here. The region had a bear cat before we transitioned. When we transitioned, Fulton County decided to keep the Bearcat. This is about safety of our police officers to do the job that's required of them to do. We asked, we said that public safety was going to be priority. So we need to give our officers whatever it, they need to do their job. Economic development, Ms. Uh, Councilmember Rob can tell you we are in an academy right now with economic development. The two factors to improve our economic development is going to be improving our school system and, and improving our crime. Yes, we do need to um, have programs. We do need to have better jobs in the area, but we also have to uh, deal with the issues that we already have here. And I'm tired of people feeling like if they want to commit a crime, they can come to Fulton County, specifically City of South Fulton. Ms. Gomez? Okay, and um, just refresh my memory again. How much would one of these trucks cost? I'm sorry, it's, it's right at 400000 And you just need one, correct? Just one. So, and you said that there's a $400,000 cost savings on salaries. That's $2.3 million in salary savings. So that you all have saved yes. from not hiring additional officers or right. school? As we went over the course of the year, we were hiring police officers, but you know, there's a catch up part of that. If you don't hire all of your police officers right at the beginning of that budget cycle, you're gonna start realizing savings that at that point. And so we hired 52 police officers from um, uh, August of 2018 up to up to today. Uh, and I think I came before the body this time last year, and I think you all asked me why I didn't ask for more police officers. And I said, well, I want to budget to a number that I can realistically hire over the course of a year. 
so that we could be good stewards of that money. And so uh, hiring 52, I, I think I said then that the most I had ever hired was 41. Now it's 52. And so with the direction that we've gone in with our salaries and so forth, uh, just the other day we had 40 people to show up for our physical agility test. And eight of those were from um, um, other surrounding jurisdictions. And so we expect that with the new salaries that are coming in place, that we'll be able to recruit at a much uh, faster rate as we move forward. And based off of this $400,000 cost savings, you didn't think of any other uh, things you may need, like more equipment other than this big item? We did. Um, we, as we were going through budget deliberations for FY20, there was certainly uh, a lot of discussions that we've had uh, with respects to uh, radios and other equipment uh, needs that we have moving forward. Certainly, uh, those are the sort of things, uh, even that into the E911 Center uh, as we move forward, things that we'll need uh, to start getting ready uh, to move ourselves to that space. Uh, um, I'm trying to go back to the map. So. Um, so the 66 narcotics um, investigations, where along, is that all over throughout the city? Or so if you look, along? I literally just today I got the an update from Georgia Tech on our beat redesign study. They've gone through the first iteration of uh, the beat design, and if you look at the southern, the southeast portion of that map, that's where a bulk of our E911 calls are coming in, and consequently that's along the old national corridor. That's where a majority of our narcotics investigations, up to and including our Godby Road, are taking place right now. And so if you literally were able to see that map that I just got from Georgia Tech today it would make a great deal of sense based on the amount of 911 calls uh, that we received and where those drug and gang locations are as well. All right, and, and part of my ignorance, like w in what situation would you use this? Because this kind of, it frightens me a little bit as well mm -hmm. based on the look of it. Right. Like where would, what type of situation were you going in? And Anytime you go to a, um, uh, an armed gunman situation, you're going to take something like that. Uh, anytime you go to execute a search warrant at different drug houses, you're going to take equipment like that. Um, uh, when we're engaging uh, different gang locations, you certainly want to make sure because um, we get the calls. People just say, we have, we're hearing shots fired at such and such a place. Well, you don't want to ride up on situations like that. We have a group of individuals uh, shooting handguns and not have the ability to go with uh, an armored vehicle under those circumstances. And so, there are quite a few that I can think of over the course of the year. I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but uh, I trust me when I say that vehicle will get great use. What we won't do is uh, misuse that vehicle or, or use it for as a source of intimidation. Now, the same thing goes with our K-9 units. I mean, we don't, the K-9s aren't out there to scare people. Um, they're out there for very specific purposes. And where would this be housed? Hmm? Where would it be It will actually be housed at our new, um, our new facility, uh, in the short term, we suspect it will stay up on Cascade because that's where a majority of us. Uh, and it's behind the fence. No yes, right it will. Okay, because I don't want to see this on Twitter. <laughs> 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 okay, that's all. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Baker. Uh, Chief, I just wanted, uh, yes. wanted if you could remind us your amount of. Uh, uh, seizure money come today right now? So far we're close uh, to uh, 876000 but that's a, that's a combination of drug seizures along with um, drug seizures along with um, cars, jewelry, and things of that nature. Um, mm -hmm. But the total value is close to 876000 So that's the total value that, that we're able to keep from this stuff that was confiscated right. while you think it was so outside of that, how much of that is cash? Right now, I think we have 206000 in cash. We have a majority of the cash in our custody. We cannot show it as um, an asset that we can spend until the courts release it. So a majority of those monies are in our custody. But if you look at our um, state and, and federal RICO funds, right now it, it totals to close to 200 and some odd thousand. Somewhere in there. Uh, we just sold a Lamborghini for three hundred and forty-five thousand, and we're expecting a check from the DEA for I think it's like one hundred and nine or something like that. And you've done comps on this 
But this uh, actual uh, Linco uh, makes the Bearcat. Uh, there are um, there are other armored vehicles out there, most for military use. Uh, there are very few specifically for um, uh, law enforcement use. And so uh, widely throughout the United States, the Bearcat, the Linco Bearcat, is the one that's used for law enforcement. And Fulton County currently has one right now. They do. Do we ever use theirs in uh, IRS situations? Uh, how are we working with the departments? So and then also, are there other uh, nearby municipalities who actually have one? Uh, Atlanta has one. Fulton County has one. Sandy Springs, I believe, has one. Um, I think in Doraville or Dunwoody. Uh, but uh, don't quote me on that one. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain that it's a majority. The majority of the cities our size are, are larger, have one. Uh, and this, but and as far as Fulton County? As far as Fulton County. Um, right now, if you're going to use somebody else's equipment, and I discussed this with the mayor earlier this week, um, it's important that you train with that other entity. Certainly, we've made that offer um, to Fulton County, and we haven't uh, received the favorable response at this point. Um, we're currently training with the Fulton County schools. Um, they have a SWAT unit, and so we've kind of created a force multiplier with them. So that whenever we have these scenarios, not only are we responding, um, they're responding as well. And that's been in every one of the armed gunmen situations that we've had so far. And I'm sorry, if I missed, they don't have one, right? They don't. Okay. But if a situation happened at a school where they had an active shooter, um, we would respond in tandem with them because of that partnership and that understanding that we have with Fulton County Schools. Still yard. Mm -hmm. So you have in here that it costs four hundred thousand. Yes. And that you had salary savings. Yes. So right now we have a draft budget. Mm -hmm. It's not final, but it is a draft. Yes, ma'am. And so in order to fund it, we would have to decrease somebody else's budget by four hundred thousand dollars. Because once there is the savings, it goes into a pot. And then that pot is used to distribute, you know, throughout the city. So um, that would be a little bit complicated uh, at this point. To, to go in and find it, it would have to come out of some other lines. I just wanted to um, to say that, that, that it's not as, as simplistic as you know, we had $2 million savings, and of that savings, we'd like to spend 400000 because probably other departments did too. And so I uh, just, even if we were to say, well, this is really a great idea, we want to do it, but, um, we'd have to take another look at the entire budget and we'd like to do that. So I just want to share that. Okay, uh, Ms. Jackson. Um, <coughs> The money that um, you confiscate, mm -hmm. is you just turned it off. The money that's confiscated, mm -hmm. um, is there, I know you, as far as equipment, it has to be used in uh, public safety, but my question is, is there a way that we can kind of divert some of the, the funding to uh, educational pieces for young people, uh, for our children, mm -hmm. like different workshop seminars uh, on crime, that type of thing? There's a specific law in uh, assets and forfeiture, it's called supplanting, where you can't take funds and use them towards um, uh, things that should come under the regular general fund. Um, educational piece for children, I don't. I'm saying based on crime, because we know we have a gang issue. We have, you know, problems as far as young people, so there's no way that we can that's something that I don't have to actually research. Uh, the truth is, I don't know the answer to that right now. I have to actually look into it. Oh. Could it go Tra into the past? Tracy actually managed all of the uh, the assets forfeiture money for me in Atlanta, and she's done it here in College Park, too. So she's actually the expert on it. Okay. I would say also that we can keep our comments toward the air camp. Okay. And we can come back to it. 
to answer your uh, question, Councilmember Jackson, uh, you know, we cannot use those swaths for that specific purpose. Uh, and I, I know what you're saying, that's that gray area uh, that uh, the federal folks uh, kind of shine on. So we cannot use those funds for that specific uh, area. Now for the education of the officers, are those things uh, strictly related to enhancing law enforcement and their ability to do their job as, as, uh, as police officers? We can use it as far as that's concerned, but not for uh, those kinds of things. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for responding, Ms. Tracy. Um, I was going to, uh, I actually have been advocating on a, on a federal level um, requesting for our congressmen uh, not to uh, do legislation to take away asset forfeitures because that is uh, one of the things they are looking to do. And, I, and one of the things that was said is that asset forfeitures have specific uses and they cannot be used to pay for anything that a general fund would typically uh, pay for. And she just answers your question as far as trend. I've done research on it myself, but I, uh, I, do, I do want an accounting of the asset forfeitures and then how it's expended, and that I have not gotten. But let's keep it specific to Bearcat. Again, this is something that our region needs. I'm glad our pro Tim Baker asked that question as far as the school is concerned. Um, active shooting is on the rise, and I do not want us to be in a reactive mode when it comes to us responding to situations. Yes, there is, um, we did have one in the region, in this area, but once we transitioned, Fulton County did take the Bearcat. So we do need, a, we're the fifth largest city in Georgia, third in Fulton County, we do need our own. Okay, um, let me say that during the time of the annexation, there was a barricade, and uh, we really wanted to, to get the barricade from Fulton County, but those negotiations broke down. But I also want to hear what Chief said when he came up to his microphone, that he brought two machine guns out of the store and on National Highway. Those same two machine guns could have been directed at some officer, some squat member who did not have the protection of a barricade. Uh, to get the way you want to go. We are about the ability, the ability to make sure that we have good public safety, but we're also about the business of making sure that those who strap those guns on every morning kiss their wives and children goodbye that they come home at night. If this is what it takes for us to do that. I'm for it 100%. I told you I've seen it happen in my own, with my own eyes in a hostile situation. And it's quite embarrassing to see our SWAT people come up in a car and get to get ready to do what they have to do. And I'll leave it with this. My biggest fear in public safety is that somebody can have a bigger gun than we got. They got it, they got it now. Somebody, we're going to be outmanned, we're going to be outgunned. So we need to make sure that our, our officers get it as much protection as we can. Thank you, Chief, for making this for Thank you so much. Okay. Next item is South Fulton Comprehensive Transportation Plan status update by Morin Mobility Partners. Uh, good evening, Council and Mayor. Uh, tonight we're going to have an update from MMP with regards to the South Fulton Comprehensive Transportation Plan uh, that's been administered by the Atlanta Regional Commission. I'm going to introduce uh, Ms. Kennedy and Ms. Kemp that will be uh, doing the presentation for you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you. Um, Inga Kennedy with the Southern Fulton Comprehensive Transportation Plan for all of the cities in the south part of the county. Tonight's presentation uh, gives you an update of what's happening with the project and what you can expect. Uh, the presentation was made to the South Fulton Municipal Association back in May, and the mayor and a couple of council members were in attendance as well. Uh, the presentation was presented at our stakeholder committee around the same time, and some of you were there as well. 
And so the purpose tonight is to make sure that everyone has a chance to uh, learn more about the process and to answer any questions that uh, you may have. And I'll turn it over to Kelly Kemp, who's our project manager from Modern Mobility Partners. You all met her as well. Thank you, Inga. <clears throat> Way one point this way. Um, again, my name is Kelly Kemp. I'm with Modern Mobility Partners. I'm going to try to breeze through this because I see the, the clock ticking down. Um, so we have PEQ Inga on our team as well as ACOM and Arcadis. Um, and so tonight, what we're going to do is going to give you an overview of what the Southern Fulton Comprehensive Transportation Plan is, our engagement that we have coming up, both digital and in person the vision, goals, and objectives, and project prioritization process that we're going through right now, and then what our next steps are. So this is our study area. You can mention that it's all eight um, cities within Southern Fulton County, as well as unincorporated Fulton County. Um, and we are scoped to do several things, uh, but essentially, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but we have a robust engagement process that all goes through. We have an inventory analysis that we're wrapping up right now, as well as an assessment of the short and long range needs focusing on transportation in the area. Um, and we'll be doing some detailed corridor analyses and then coming up with a fiscally constrained project list um, for the next five to ten years. So the study is centered around four milestones, uh, the vision goals and objectives and the existing conditions and project prioritization framework, so that's what we're working on right now, followed by the short and long range needs and the preliminary recommendations. This is our high level milestone schedule. We started back in February of this year. Uh, currently here in August, we are wrapping up task three, the inventory analysis and getting into the assessment. Um, we've had a couple of project management team meetings, a stakeholder committee meeting, and we're going to be having another round of those shortly, uh, and I'll get more into those. And we're wrapping up the study in July of next year, uh, and in the spring as well, we'll come back with preliminary recommendations to give the feedback. Um, this just gives a brief update of where we've been. Back in March, we ramped up and got started and started collecting data and put together our engagement strategy, followed um, by beginning our inventory analysis and beginning to refine our vision and inventory um, and continuing with um, starting council, city council meetings. So we started meeting, doing these presentations with the different city councils back in June. Uh, we're glad to be here tonight, and again, we'll be re returning um, in the spring of, of next year. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Aerotropolis Freight Cluster Plan that we are also a part of as part of a separate study. We don't want to duplicate any efforts um, and make sure we, we leverage those opportunities, so we're going to take the information from the Freight Cluster Plan and incorporate it into our uh, study and build off of that. So we just want to be good stewards of everyone's funds and so make sure we, we piggyback off of that. Um, so I mentioned the outreach strategy that Inga here is leading. Um, we have the project management team, uh, which includes a member um, from the city, uh, city of South Fulton, as well as multiple members on the stakeholder committee that we'll get to shortly. Um, but everything goes through the PMT and the stakeholder committees before it goes out to the public. Uh, we will be getting into our first round of public meetings soon. Uh, I'll bring that up shortly. Uh, we also have some roving outreach going on. Inga and her team were at the, the National Night Out back on the 6th, um, which was a big hit. We got a lot of feedback um, from citizens there. And we've also launched an online survey, as well as had hard copies at that event, as well as others. And I think we had about 42 or so responses there. So that was successful um, and as part of that effort we're asking folks what's important to them and what they value when it comes to prioritizing projects for the transportation system uh, and then uh, again we mentioned we'll be back in, in uh, the spring we will also be doing a bus tour uh, we had a charrette or an abbreviated version of the charrette at the South Fulton Municipal Association that several of you were at uh, a couple of months ago that you mentioned the project management team includes representatives from all eight cities, as well as Fulton County, the Atlanta Regional Commission, the three CIDs, and GDOT. 
and the stakeholder committee includes, includes those entities as well as MARTA, the airport, uh, we've invited you know, Uber, uh, the railroads, we've got the school systems, uh, chambers, uh, beautification, we, we try to have cross-cutting cross representation. Um, so for the city of South Fulton, we have Rusan, there it is, um, who represents the PMT and the stakeholder committee, but I'll add that we have several other representatives representing city of South Fulton, um, also on the stakeholder committee. I think there's about five or six folks um, in total. Actually, you're one of them, councilwoman. Um, and so uh, we'll be meeting up with that committee soon. Um, I mentioned we're going to be having uh, our first round of public meetings in September. Uh, so we're getting those finalized on the schedules now. So we'll be hearing about those soon. We are going to do a bus tour probably mid to late October, uh, taking the feedback that we receive from the public as well as our existing conditions analysis and taking folks out and really seeing firsthand what some of the issues and opportunities are. And I mentioned the, the roving outreach that's ongoing. We also have um, a project website, southernfoldctp.org, that is up and running, as well as a project email, and we are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And as I mentioned earlier, we have an online survey uh, going on right now, and we actually just extended it to about the 19th to give folks a little more time to respond after starting back with school and stuff. Um, vision, goals, and objectives. This is just the vision from the last CTP that was done in 2013. Uh, we are in the process of refining that now based on the feedback that we've been receiving from the project management team, the stakeholder stakeholder committee and the mayor's charrette, um, as well as from the general public through the online survey. Uh, there's also goals and objectives. These are from the last CTP. We're updating those as well. Um, but what we did establish was eight categories to prioritize projects based on feedback from the PMT, the stakeholder committee, and the mayor's charrette. So I'm going to go through those very quickly because uh, I know we're short on time. Safety. Uh, so we're looking at high crash locations, bike pedestrian locations that are maybe high risk, proximity to schools and EMS facilities, uh, public health, so if it's anticipated reduction in emissions, whether it's active transportation like bicycle, pedestrian, transit, proximity to medical facilities, system preservation or state of good repair, making sure we're taking care of what we got, uh, whether it relates to pavement or bridges or even critical vulnerable transportation assets which are those that are being identified by the Atlanta Regional Commission as part of a separate resilience plan based on um, high flooding and heat prone areas. Regional impact, so whether or not projects will benefit multiple jurisdictions, um, as well as improve access to environmental justice communities, which are low income, minority, elderly, and disabled, and or disabled. Um, project readiness, so how easy it is to implement, so if there's some low-hanging fruit out there, if they've already been through preliminary engineering um, or right away, um, and so taking that in, into account, economic impacts, looking at the return on investment, freight volumes and proximity to activity centers, mobility options and access, so looking at uh, new modes that are being developed as a result, um, or improving existing modes of travel. And then last but not least, connectivity and reliability, uh, congestion relief, and your improved connection regardless of mode. So we're developing waiting scenarios based on the feedback we received as well as what we're getting through the online survey. We've got a couple of hundred folks um, with the online survey and hard copies so far, uh, potentially more so that's growing. And then once we get all that feedback, we're gonna slice and dice it up by city as well as by um, you know, PMT, stakeholder, et cetera, and come up with um, a hybrid scenario. We'll then populate, okay. we'll then populate the metrics uh, for each project and come up with a score um, to rank and prioritize the project. So ultimately, we'll have a master list of projects for the whole Southern Fulton region, and then we'll also have a prioritized list based on what you value in your region, in your city, by city, okay? Um, yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, so the next steps are to refine the vision, uh, the goals and objectives, and the waiting scenarios based on the feedback. And I believe. Oh. We almost there we go. Y'all move me. 
I'm almost there. I'm trying to do it in the same Any questions? Yes. Um, I'm going to do any to Q. Yes, you do. Um, I'm going to the Q. Uh, can you get the dates for the um, meetings, the public meetings to us as soon as possible because we have an economic development meeting that we're about to do. Mm -hmm. We we got a lot of meetings coming up. I and, know. And, and <laughs> we, what we want to do is, yeah. is, you know, make sure we get all the information to our residents. Mm -hmm. Because what we don't want the residents to do is not show up to these meetings because um, there are too many meetings. So we need to try to group, group them together as much as I know Ms. Inga like to have her own thing independently, but I'm sorry, our residents cannot, we cannot do this to residents. Alright, thank you. Yeah, I think we're open to piggybacking our opportunities. Okay. So, yeah. Mr. Kareem, um, what is the plan for our bus stops? When, when, when might we see a change? In those? So, um, okay, so I'm going to try to give you the short answer to that. So we are in the beginning of the study looking at the inventory and doing an assessment of what the needs are. But what I can tell you is, um, just from looking around the area, there's definitely a lack of bus stop amenities. Um, and we've also been talking to MARTA about their bus shelter program and recognize that they plan on um, putting out 5,000 new bus shelters in the next five years, 1,000 each year. And so we've been talking to them about what is required to kind of get on that list because they don't really have a defined list yet. Um, so we're going to be looking at that, and that includes ADA accessibility and stuff like that. And so we're going to be looking at that as part of our analysis so that we can help give them a list of potential um, shelters. Um, and then we'll also be looking at sidewalks and ADA accessibility, et cetera, and just other amenities, whether they're technology related or not. And then also looking at station area planning and stuff like that. So we are looking at that. We'll have preliminary recommendations um, in the spring. Um, and then, you know, if they get into the prioritized list, then it just matters, it's a matter of how quickly it takes to get those implemented into funding. Um, I would ask just that the top of your list uh -huh. be 5440 Fulton Industrial Boulevard. <laughs> that is our city hall. We don't have a, we don't have a bench. We don't have a trash can. It's a trash bag hanging up on the market side. So that'd be really nice. Yeah, that was uh, one of the, uh, honestly, I, I've done a lot of uh, driving around here. I, I, we're in downtown Atlanta, but a lot of driving around here, and that's the first thing I noticed is the bus stop amenities are really lacking. So. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And I'm making note of that. Right. <laughs> Any further comments? Seeing that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. your presentation. Next item is council discussion on resolution of forming a South Fulton Convention and District Bureau. Council Member Williams. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you all recall, but um, this is something that I requested that we set up um, when we were going through the before we were going through the legislative process. Um, uh, for the hotel motel tax. Uh, most cities have uh, DMOs and uh, DMOs are used to uh, promote the city, bring trade, show, bring trade shows, uh, also bring conventions, and basically attract tourists and advertise their city. Um, in College Park, they have uh, Airport West Chambers pretty much operating their DMO, and I have done uh, a lot of research on this, and I think it's best for the city of South Fulton to create their own, uh, so what, what we're going to call South Fulton Convention and Visitors Bureau, so that we can have our own autonomy uh, instead of joining in with other cities, College Park, Hayville, East Point, and I think it's one other city, they all pay into one DMO and contribute, um, and that's what they use to promote their uh, cities. Unit Union City, uh, I'm not sure what they pay into, but with a city of this size, I think that we should create our own and 
And this is just a proposal. So I guess if you all have any questions, do you all read this? Um, I will entertain you at this time. And Mr. Pike, I've worked with him on this as well. So he will be willing to answer any questions. Are there any questions at this time? Chairman Gunn, Madam Clerk. Next item is the Chief Financial Officer uh, presenting the 2018 audit report. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Council members. We have our external auditors with us that are going to present our 2020 audit report. Mr. Moses. Good evening to the Mayor, City Council members. Uh, my name is Doug Moses. I'm partner with Mauler Jenkins. And I'll be here to present the 2018 results. Hopefully you've received the financial statements, the auditor's discussion and analysis and management letter. Uh, I'm just going to kind of touch on some of the highlights in this presentation. If you have any questions as I'm going through, uh, please stop me and I'll address them at that time. Uh, just a quick update, update about Monitor Jenkins. You know, we've added our eighth office um, in Savannah, Georgia. So we happen to have that addition with four offices now in Georgia. Our governmental practice still continues to be one of the largest niches in the firm, representing about 28% of the firm's practice. Uh, we audit over 400 governmental clients in the southeast. That includes about 115 cities, as well as 115 of those uh, governmental clients receive the GFOA Award in Excellence in Financial Reporting. Um, my understanding that um, the city may be looking to do a CAFR next year and participate in that award program. So we look forward to working with the city um, in terms of uh, applying for that award. For 2019. Again, I was the partner responsible for the overall audit engagement with 20 years of experience. Uh, James was the audit service partner with 16 years of experience. Um, not only here is um, David Earl. Uh, he was uh, new as far as providing the quality assurance uh, partner review uh, with over 14 years of experience. And all of us spent 100% of our time doing government audits. And now we'll look at some other industries that we serve and other services that we provide other than your traditional accounting and uh, traditional tax services. As far as financial statements, the financial statements are the responsibility of the city council and management. Our responsibility as your external and independent auditor is to give an opinion on those financial statements. We've issued an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion, which is what you will hope to get from the external and independent auditor. Um, as you can see, the audit report date was as of June 24, 2019, for the fiscal year 2018 uh, financial statements audit, uh, which means that the city did not meet the March 31st deadline. And I, I'll get into that a little later when I talk about the findings, which led to the delay in the audit. Uh, we did have four findings. Um, typo here, um, instead of it being two instances of non-compliance, it was one instance of non-compliance which is combined with one of the financial statements findings. So again, four findings, and we'll talk about that a little later. Um, main thing here I just want to point out is um, there were no significant new uh, policies implemented during this year 2018. Um, as far as management's judgments and accounting estimates, um, we did evaluate the estimates uh, um, that management uh, came up with that affected like accounts receivables and dealing with allowances as well as depreciation expense for capital assets to deal with those estimates and being those estimates were uh, reasonable. As far as our relationship with management, we received full cooperation from management staff and others. There were no disagreements with management on accounting issues or financial reporting uh, matters. As far as audit adjustments, we did propose uh, several audit adjustments um, that are reflected, reflected in your financial statements. And uh, some of those adjustments did result in findings, and we'll talk about that later as well. As far as our independence, we are independent of the city of South Fulton and its financial reporting processes. Um, there were no um, fees paid to Mauler and Jenkins for any type of management advisory services, which would have impacted our independence as your external independent auditor. All right, the next few slides kind of go over some financial trends. Um, before I talk about uh, the fund balance um, comparison to expenditures. 
uh, looking at your government-wide financial statements from that, from that perspective, again, you don't have any proprietary funds at this time or business activity. Um, you just have governmental funds. And so looking at your, um, your governmental activities, net position on a full accrual basis, which reports your capital assets and any uh, long-term debt, uh, your net position went from a negative roughly $5.9 million, uh, million dollars in the prior year, as of June, um, September 30th, 2017, to a positive net position of $5.2 million, okay? That's an increase of about $11 million, and that's due to you all getting the infrastructure and capital assets to Fulton County. That was re um, reflecting your financial savings at the government-wide level as capital contributions. So you didn't get cash, but in, in order to recognize those assets in your financial statements, um, that results in your net position increasing at the government-wide level. So if you look at the different categories of net position for your governmental activities at the government-wide level, you have about $13 million invested in capital assets uh, related to that infrastructure that came over from Fulton County. You had about $51,000 restricted for um, hospitality and tourism. And then you had about $7.9 million unrestricted deficit, okay, uh, at the government-wide level. So again, just wanted to point that out to you in looking at um, the city-wide financial statements at the uh, government-wide level. But looking at your fund balance for your general fund, which is your main operating fund, um, this slide here is looking at some of the other newly incorporated cities with September 30 year in. Um, so you can see how you all have done compared to some of these other cities. Uh, last year, when looking at your fund balance as a percentage of expenditures, uh, it was about a negative 36%. And for year two, it went up to a negative 16.9%. Um, and based on year three, um, the budget amounts that has been presented for 2019, you are looking to be right under 20% positive. A good rule of thumb is to have anywhere from two to three months reserve. That's about 16 to 25%. And so it looks like you guys are, are working towards that goal in the near future. Your, your fund balance for your general fund at 9-30-2017 was a deficit of $6.5 million. Um, for 9-30-2018, it's a deficit of $8.7 million, uh, which is an increase of about $2.2 million for that deficit in fund balance. Uh, next slide looks at the um, newly incorporated cities with December year ends, and again, uh, cities and other local governments with December year year in um, normally sit pretty, pretty healthy at year end because they collect the majority of their taxes, which will be used um, to cover operations in the next calendar year. Like for you all at year end at 9 30, 2018, you had about $28 million of property tax receivable. All of that was deferred because it's, it's supposed to be used for fiscal year 2019. So if you were looking at your financial statements, you'll see. Your assets, part of your asset, you have about $28 million of property taxes, but all of that is deferred because it has to be used for operations in 2019. Um, and here are some cities with June 30 year end, some of the incorporated cities, and see how their ratio um, paired out in their first years of operations as well. Uh, looking at the general fund um, revenues as of September 30, 2018, uh, your total revenues were $50.2 million compared to $11.6 million in the prior year. Again, that was a short period, over four months, five months in 2017. Um, so your largest revenue uh, as of 9 2018 was sales taxes of $24.6 million. That's 49% of the total revenues uh, compared to prior year sales taxes of $9.7 million. And then your next largest revenue source was $15.5 million in property taxes. And again, um, this year is the first year you, you reflected property taxes in the financial statements. So again, that's a $38.6 million increase in revenues or a 333% increase for the prior year. Uh, expenditures, um, total expenditures as of 2018 was $51.3 million compared to $18.1 million in the prior year. That's a $40.2 million increase or roughly 222% uh, increase over the prior year. So of course, as you all mentioned earlier, one of your largest expenditures is public safety, um, which was about $31.1 million. 
which represents 61% of the total, and that compares to $12.1 million in the prior period. Your next largest uh, expenditure was in public works, uh, about $7.4 million, uh, compared to $1.8 million in the prior period, and that's about 14% of the total. Any questions on the financial trends? All right, we had four findings um, and two are repeats from the prior year. Um, you asked me, is this unusual? No, it's not. For a new city, uh, it's bringing on a lot of services from the county, infrastructure and things of that nature, you're gonna have some of these hiccups. Um, we did have some turnover and some positions in the finance department with those individuals being uh, responsible for the year and closeout procedures that left. Um, shortly after September 30, 2018. Um, so that right now, I think you all are fully staffed in the accounting department, so I don't see some of these issues uh, popping up next year. But we did have issues with, uh, again, segregation of duties, um, where during our testing of disbursements, we noticed where department heads can create their own purchase order or purchase request uh, without being approved by another individual. So we recommend um, that any uh, purchase orders to be approved by someone other than within that department, like the city manager or the uh, CFO. Also relating to um, our payroll walkthrough procedures, we noticed where payroll change forms um, were not being reviewed and signed off by the CFO as well. Uh, so we'll make sure that any uh, anyone that is uh, requesting or, or having a pay rate change, uh, and each, that form needs to be signed by the employee, the department head, and city manager and or the um, CFO. And also on these findings, you'll see where the, uh, the city has responded to um, the findings based on their uh, creative action plan to uh, resolve these issues going forward. Now you still might see this as a repeat next year because the policy wasn't implemented until months ago or so. So, um, so we may run into some testing for fiscal year 2019 at the beginning of um, that uh, period where we may have uh, some issues like this again in our testing that may result in a uh, finding for next year. Capital asset report. Uh, this was uh, where we had to propose about $9.9 .9 million of adjustments to ensure that the capital assets were uh, reported correctly. Uh, when the city uh, took over some of the infrastructure from the uh, county, um, they reported um, the assets at the fair market value. Um, now, if you're receiving donations from like a developer, uh, another third party, yes, that's supposed to be reported at the fair market value. But when you have capital assets being transferred over from another government where you're taking over services, that has to be reported at the net book value or the carrying value that's reported by that entity, that government. And so we had to. Uh, I uh, work with the uh, city of South Fulton um, to, to, to get information from the, the county, uh, which um, they ran into some problems in getting that information. So we had to do an alternative procedure as far as uh, coming up with an estimated carrying value of those assets that were transferred over. So that resulted in the delay in the audit uh, as the city had to, to, to work to get that information uh, for us to look at the test. Also, we noticed that some of the capital assets um, uh, that were recorded as additions uh, were under the city's uh, capitalization policy threshold. So we had to remove those assets. And then we also noticed where you had errors in the calculation of depreciation schedule or uh, expense within uh, the Excel document. And a lot of times we do see that when capital asset details are maintained in an Excel document. Uh, the city does have a capital uh, asset software system that they're going to be uploading that information into. So hopefully going forward, we won't have that issue. So again, uh, that resulted in about $9.9 .9 million of adjustments to capital assets as of September 30, 2018. And I think the city has a good response to that finding that will uh, hopefully eliminate that from repeating for next year. Um, third finding deals with the hotel motel uh, revenues and expenditures, and this is also a compliance finding as well. Uh, we know that we're, uh, the city had reported about $51,000 as a liability and expenditures as of September 3rd, 2018. Um, upon further review, those um, expenditures were incurred subsequent to year end should have not been reported as a liability. So we made entries to remove the liability and expenditures 
um, which resulted in the $51,000 of revenues being restricted in fund balance. Uh, in accordance with state law, you have to spend a certain percentage of those revenues to go towards tourism, um, activities, and promotion of tourism, things of that nature, and the city did not spend anything as of 9 30 2018, so that results in the compliance finding. So, um, so you see the response that City management has and can work with you all to establish uh, identify and qualified programs uh, to spend that money going forward. Um, the last finding this is a repeat from the prior year. We had to make about $1.6 uh, million dollars of adjustments to receivables to ensure that receivables work correctly within the funds, uh, within the general fund, or within the multiple grant fund as well. And so that's it as far as the findings. Um, and, you know, four findings this year, nothing unusual. Um, it's kind of what's expected for a newly incorporated city, taking on uh, services and uh, capital assets from the government. Um, we had four management points um, this year versus seven management points last year. Um, the first one deals with disbursement approvals. Um, we noticed where we tested about 25 expenditures. Uh, I noticed that three of the uh, uh, invoices did not, were not approved or did not have purchase orders associated with them, wasn't approved in the system or uh, mainly approved by staff, or I'm sorry, by staff or signatures. So we need to make sure that all expenditures uh, are approved accordingly. Uh, we noticed that six instances where um, the uh, city could not provide any evidence of approval for recurring expenditures such as utility dealings um, bills and things of that nature. So again, all invoices, all expenditures must be approved in accordance with the city's policy. Um, P card transactions. Um, this is what can, you know, uh, put you know governments in the news where people can you know this this handle this use uh, P card transactions. Uh, we did notice or look at eight transactions pertaining to P cards, and two out of the eight transactions were missing any in, in, indication of. Uh, being approved or reviewed by anyone. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to have, you know, to be part of purchase things, uh, but you still have to fill out a, uh, a, a requisition uh, before using the B card transaction. That's the sound controls um, that should be in place. Um, policy adoption, this is a repeat from last year. Um, we, had, we had five items uh, for, you, for you all to consider implementing a policy for. Um, you did implement um, policies for compensated absences, purchases, purchasing uh, credit card and capital assets. The last one that needed to be uh, implemented was for record retention. So we recommend that we get that policy uh, approved this year 2019, not already done. And then the last one um, is a recommendation that we're um, putting for all of our clients uh, relating to cybersecurity risk. Uh, as you heard, um, a lot of local governments are being hit with ransoms now. Uh, had a client, we had a client um, uh, that they actually had to pay the ransom about five hundred thousand dollars because the hackers came in and locked their system down. They didn't receive uh, email or white calls, and so it's very important to, uh, to look at your uh, IT framework. But you all have an IT framework. You do have monitoring in place. I uh, just need to make sure that you add cybersecurity. A monitoring component to that, make sure it's being addressed accordingly. Uh, I did talk with the IT person here. Uh, he is uh, proposing a new position for cybersecurity, which is awesome. Uh, and we all hope we'll be approving that in the fiscal year 2020 budget. Um, but again, that's uh, very important. Uh, and a lot of governments are being hit with cybersecurity. And then, real quick, a uh, couple of uh, new standards I just wanted to mention. Um, Statement number 87 deals with leases. This will be applicable for you all in fiscal year 2021, I believe, which uh, is going to result in a lot of governments reporting what they normally would have as operating leases. Um, they're going to be reflected as capital leases. We have to recognize the capital asset as well as the liability in the financial statement. So we do is really going to see a lot of uh, governments showing more capital leases uh, versus uh, operating leases in the past. And then the last standard I want to mention to you is uh, statement number 88 that deals with certain disclosures related to debt. 
um, where in the footnotes you're going to have to separate the debt out between direct borrowings and direct placements. Um, also, if you had any uh, line of credits and you didn't use the line of credit during the year, you have to report that unused balance uh, as of year end as well. So this is, deals with footnote disclosures pertaining to debt. Currently, you all do not have any long-term debt. Uh, only long-term debt you have pertains to compensated absences and uh, pollution remediation, remediation liability. Uh, you do have a short-term note with the tax anticipation note, but again, you don't have any revenue bonds, things of that nature. But if you enter into um, you know, a revenue bond and things of that nature, then you have to follow this standard in the current year that we're in, fiscal year 2019. And we continue to offer free continuing education classes to our clients uh, where they can earn 28 hours of CPE credit throughout the year. Uh, and your staff, your management has uh, participated in those classes. Again, it's free of charge and uh, it's been a big hit for our clients and see various topics that we provide. Um, on an annual, annual basis, four times a year. So if anybody wants to be added to that list, just let me know and we'll get you on the invite list. So uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, it's an honor to present to you all. I'm not going to address any questions uh, at this time. Thank you, colleagues. I think what we can do is entertain questions until about a quarter until it's extended our work session and come back after a short break. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Uh, Mr. Gillette. Of course, I just lost. I just lost my place. Uh, uh, can, can Dr. Rao go? Can I yield to you? I'm sure you can, Dr. Rao. I'm just going to let you grab her. She likes it. So, um, you know, I'll look at another assignment that you So all the rights up we have addressed them. If you see the rights up, then I've got response each one of those ones. But what still stands is the retention um, retention policy. And retention policy, I think we had one from the attorney that was adopted from the state until we have our own. So we are working on the retention policy, but so far I think we have said one suggested by the attorney to use it from the state. And that's not only for finances, all throughout different, including the management, the club, which is just comprehensive for potential for um, no, for that was it. So when you say that, are you just referencing legislation that has passed by council? I'm talking about in terms of your internal, so that all your employees know that the process is. Do we have a set of those policies? So we have set up those ones, and we are having the um, standard operating procedures as well, putting the new grades one by one. So we have internal controls, and all of the four rights up of the address and credit to be answered. So will that document be similar to what we saw um, come forth from like HR and police? Yes. I had to first uh, counsel on the road. Um, where is the record? In, where is the record in retention policy? I, I, I submitted that months ago um, in a legislative process. And um, I have to uh, honestly give Mr. Pasco credit and also um, the Sharon credit as well because they have consistently reminded me that we were going to get dinged again on this audit if we did not get that policy um, on the agenda. That's a question for the person who handles the list. I mean, that would be you because I submitted it months ago. Yeah, it's gone through the legislation process. I can put it on it the next agenda. That's not a problem. But I don't understand why it wasn't on the agenda in the first place. I submitted it months ago. For this meeting? No, I submitted it months ago, so it should have been on some <coughs> meetings. Mr. Pastor, where are you? He wouldn't be here this evening. Okay. Yeah. I thought he typically. Oh, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to be Mr. Khalid, are you, did you find yeah. a place? Uh, I didn't find it, but I'm going to just go ahead. Uh, the first thing I want to do, uh, sort of piggybacks off of uh, Dr. Rao, the 
the procedure that I'm most interested in is the is the uh, the requisite <coughs> reimbursement procedure, which in my two years I felt like has changed a couple of times. Do you all ever make recommendations for what procedure we should use? Yes, um, I can give you an example of what some of my other clients do. Um, for instance, I have a particular city in Metro Atlanta that will allow the CFO or the finance to um, allow the city manager to approve any purchase orders that's $10,000 and below. Um, anything above $10,000 has to be approved by um, the mayor and city council. Uh, I've seen where. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't just. <coughs> I don't want to cut you off, but we're short on time, so I'm not asking. Okay. Number one, I'm not asking specifically. Okay. About yes, that. we can make recommendations. I'm, I'm talking about. Yes, can you make recommendations? Yes. So I'm not talking about our purchasing policy. Well, I'm not talking about large requisitions like that. Okay. But in terms of like, if I use the P card, how all, like how quickly should that be processed? Or if I need a check request to pay a vendor, you know, should I be able to get that check request back in five days, in twenty days? Uh, and, and like how many steps should that go through? I, I, we, I've been sort of asking for a flow chart of that process mm -hmm. and, and we don't have one and so sometimes it's just unclear. Right. I'm also going to use this moment to just say again that I hate Edmonds. Um, and, when, and when our requisitions get denied, we don't know until the day of the checks that we don't have a check and it's like, oh, the requisition got denied. So, gotcha. um, I, would, I would like to see uh, some sort of recommendation about that. The next thing that I wanted to, to go back to is uh, page 14 or slide 14. You talked about our capital asset reporting. Uh -huh. um, you said that some of the uh, donated uh, lands weren't properly valued. There were some depreciation issues, some errors in the schedule, and some of the, uh, the assets were incorrectly capitalized. I'm wondering, are you saying that we paid too much for some of the things that we got, or how does that affect our balance? What, what is all of that? Okay, so basically, you know, you took over services from the county. Along with that, they turned over the infrastructure pertaining to those services. So you have to, whatever you pay for it, you can't report it at that, that fair market value that you paid for it. It has to be at the carrying value from that government at the acquisition thing. So it's not that you overpay for anything, it's just, you know, follow generally a separate accounting principles, you have to report it and look the value of that government that transferred it over to you. So it wasn't like you all overpaid or something. So does, does that affect our bottom line or our finances in any way? Uh, actually, no, it actually made, like I mentioned earlier, when you look at your financial statements, the first set of uh, statements on page 14, I think, is the government-wide financial statements. You know, you recognize $13 million of capital contributions that you didn't receive cash for, per se. So that's that's where they turned over the infrastructure and all that for you all, to you all, um, with this transition. And so it actually made your bottom line at the government-wide level was pretty good because you had a deficit of $5 million in the prior year. This is in your financial statements. And now you have a, a positive net position of $5 million. All right. Um. Okay, uh, Ms. Willis, you Oh, I, I, okay. I'm going to be quiet. Okay, Ms. Gunn. I'm going to be quiet because I'm just going to be quiet. I'm just going to be quiet. Ms. Gunn, did you? Councilman Kalee took care of your question. Okay, uh, Ms. Gilead. Um, mm -hmm. What impact did, um, and, and, and not only what impact, but how detrimental it was it that A, um, the department was not fully staffed. I understand that it's much better now. That's number one. And number two is Edmonds, because we know that we still have not um, put resources uh, in with, um, to get, to enhance our technology. Mm -hmm. And so I'm assuming not having a policy manual of any kind that there's a lot of um, manual activity on. Mm -hmm. So could you speak to those two? Yes, that's right. So um, the person, you have two individuals in the first year that we did the audit for 2017 that were involved. Um, 
Millie, and then also you had consultant Steve Garber, uh, who played a crucial part in helping the city get ready during the year to close out procedures. Uh, Millie left when? Uh, in November of last year, right after year end. Now I think Steve Garber was involved a little bit, but not, uh, not a whole lot. And so those two individuals were gone, and so it was left to whoever was her name to try to work through, and they did the best they could. And so now you have some very qualified people on board along with the existing staff. So I don't see any issues going forward. As far as the, the system, you know, you want to make sure you, you, you enhance the system as much as possible to be able to allow it to be efficient. Uh, I don't know where y'all are at at this moment as far as making sure all the enhancements are done, but uh, I, I will say it's a top priority to make sure that you're able to utilize that system to the fullest versus having to do things manually if that's the case. Okay, so the fixed assets um, module has been implemented now, so that, that can be used going forward, which will take care of this issue. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. Gale. Um, one of the things that the tax loan was giving up was saying that some of the that was having the appropriate people in the right spots. Right. Uh, to avoid being, I hate to say the word. <laughs> but uh, I want to know now, uh, do we have those people, do you feel that we have those people in those positions? Yes. Uh, I'll just point out, uh, Lita Mallard has joined your team. I mean, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, well, this is her own name. But I, I, I worked with her at City College Park. She was, was crucial in helping the city get caught up when she went back to them. Um, two, they were two years behind. She got them caught up. I uh, dealt with her at Fulton County Board of Education. She did a great job there. So she's on board here. I'm glad to see her here. And so I foresee no issues going forward. And you have other individuals are within this uh, accounting department from other uh, entities as well. Uh, so you have a diverse group of individuals that pull their talents together, I believe that's going to be and a great thing. We've hired a lot of people in the last three days. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, we have a lot of people in the last three days. But I just want to make sure that from your perspective in reading that, mm -hmm. uh, will we, do we need to have some more or will we all right where we are? I think you're good in the finance department. I think that's really, really it. I, I was originally a little concerned that after I read the, the audit report, okay. um, I was a, a little concerned in the beginning, mm -hmm. but after I read the audit report, I, I sort of saw how a lot of things happened. Mm -hmm. And, but I know that a lot of things have improved as well. Right. And, and really, I, um, I still would like to give uh, kudos to the department because we started out with nothing. So right. I'll never forget that. Right. And we really, really come a long way. We have a long way to go. But we've come in and we really have. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gunn. I can't, so I don't know why. It's they just like you being on the back there. Are they in certain places? If not, why don't we take our break now and yeah. come back at the time we resume with the budget? Okay? So we're going to make a session later? No. Later? Because we got a lot. We got a couple. That's why I'm going to do that. Yeah, but uh, later. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <laughs> That's how we're going to do it.